Lord, make your word swift. May it fill our heads with knowledge, our hearts with grace, and our lives with holiness. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The chosen people. The chosen people. It's a... It's one actual continuous theme right through the Bible that God has a people who he's chosen. Um, It is a little bit controversial over the past 150 years. We'll get to that in a bit. Um, And, but it is a theme nonetheless. And Peter delves into this in his epistle at this point. He, He drives home the chosenness of the church. We touched, we touched on it last week. It was a major theme. But this is really where he drives it home. He wants to drive it home to the hearts of his, into the heads and to the hearts of his listeners. Who they are. What their duties are. And what they receive from God. He wants them to know, and he wants the church to know who we are, what we do. And what we receive from God. So without further ado, let's get into it. Let's look at who we are. Peter gives a long, well, not a very long, but a list of names. He says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a people for his own possession. That's who you are if you're a Christian today. That's who you are. That's who the church is. And that word you, in the original language and in Old English, in Old English we had different ways, of, we had two ways of saying you. We only have one now, in formal English anyway, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. In, a, in the Old Bible, when it said you, It was speaking to one person. Like if I said to Barry, would you like a cup of tea? I'm just asking Barry. Would you all join me in the front room? You're speaking to a group of people. In Old English, that was ye. So there are two different words for you. We do have, to be fair, we do have ways of saying that in English today. It's like, (laughs) yous. Or y'all. No, it's, well, I'm, we're, we're Scousers, and I had it. Yeah. I, Will you shut up? That, uh, that was usually, how, that's how I got introduced to it. Um, and that's, what, that's the type of you Peter's talking about. He's talking about the church. Yes, we have these positions as individuals, but also as a group. It's the church that's the chosen race. It's the church that's the royal priesthood. It's the church that's the holy nation. And it's the church that's the people for his own possession. So going through each one in turn, we'll look at it. A chosen race. God's choice of his people is from the foundation of the world. You can read about that in Ephesians chapter 1. And in Romans 9, if you can. You know, it's, a, it's a heavy stuff. It's hard to read. It's hard to get your head round. But it's a teaching, I believe, that Scripture teaches that God chose who he would save before the foundation of the world. And indeed, last week, there was that ominous phrase that people are destined to stumble and fall. This is God's sovereign choice. God, who is over everything, who has every right to do whatever he wants to with his creation, chose a people from before the foundation of the world to be a chosen race. Again, race, um, Peter's not meaning that in the way we mean that today. Race meant people. I mean, it means that today, but we talk about uh, skin color as a race these days. Um, Race and ethnicity, overlapping but different sort of thing. Um, That's not what Peter's meaning. Peter's meaning in the sense that you're a chosen people chosen race, but they're chosen by God as an act of free grace, God's favour to those who don't deserve it. 
And it's not just that he chooses us and forgives us and then leaves us that. He makes us a royal priesthood. A royal priesthood. Those who are Christians are chosen and honoured to be priests of the Most High. In the temple in the Old Testament, only the priests had access to the holy place, to the intimate place with God. It was forbidden. Everybody else had to stay far away upon pain of death. Well, in the New Testament, all Christians are priests because we're all in Christ and he is at the right hand of the Father. So we have that intimacy and we all have it. Everyone who's in Christ, from the person who's just given their life to him, to the saint who's been walking with him for 50 years, has equal access to the Father because of Jesus Christ. A royal priesthood. Priests served God in the temple and they offered sacrifices. We looked at that last week and they prayed for the people. All Christians are called to make sacrifices, to give their lives to God as a sacrifice of praise, and to pray, to seek God's face and to plead for the things that he commands us to plead. A chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And again, a nation means a group of people that live together. The nation we live in is the United Kingdom. Um, nations are groups that live under a sovereign body that are governed by a law etc etc you know the nation we live in may change one day the structure of the UK may change England might become independent there is actually a northern independence party the, the north of England <laughs> could become an independent country. Imagine the map of Britain if that happened. You know, Scotland, the south of England, and Wales all in the UK, but the north of England out of it. And that's what he means by nation. It means a group of people. The church is called a holy nation. A holy group of people under the rule of the king, the king being the Lord Jesus Christ. And the church is distinguished by its holiness. Again, each nation has national characteristics. The Brits are known for tea, fish and chips, moaning about the weather, and making a big deal about royal occasions, which most of us neither understand nor particularly like, but we do it. But the church, the characteristic of the church is holiness and other countries make fun of us for bad food as well you know you know the, English, the British have bad food but the church that they're all on that's how the world sees us but the church must be distinguished by holiness and that means being set apart for God that we live our lives dedicated to God in love for him and obedience to his commands and the fourth thing Peter calls the church is a people for his own possession. Or his prized possession, as one translation translates it. This isn't a dictator seizing power and telling people how to live. This is a gracious father who chooses a people to delight over, to love to lavish blessings on, to give grace upon grace, to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, to not just do that, but to lift us up to a place of intimacy, not just to forgive us, but to treasure us as his children, a people for his own possession, a, a possession, a people who he lives and loves with delight, with intimacy, and in covenant forever because of Jesus Christ. That's who you are. That's who you are if you're a Christian today. Now, this is where we get, this is where Christians disagree, and we've disagreed more over this over the past 150 years. You see, in the Old Testament, 
Israel is told, you are a people holy to the Lord your God. And in the New Testament, the church is called a people holy to the Lord their God, the chosen ones. Here's how I put that together, and I'm not going to spend too long in it, because it's not the main point of the sermon, but you may have questions on that. You see, when I first became a Christian 20 years ago, everybody was, uh, Christians were quite interested in what was happening in the Middle East, because they held to a system that saw Israel as the chosen people forever, and that we had to support them against uh, the terrorists, and this was God's will, because this is how Jesus would come back. I don't hold to that system. Um, I believe when the Old Testament talked about Israel being the chosen people, it was in a fo it was the forerunning of what was to come. All the rules, all the laws, everything that was given to Israel in the Old Covenant was fulfilled by Christ. And he ultimately is the chosen one. He ultimately is the one who is the priest. He is the one who is the light to the nations. He is the one who will keep love for thousands because he's faithful. And so in him, the church receives all those blessings. And that's why these titles given to Israel are given to the church. It's not because the church has replaced Israel, as some people say. It's because the church is the fulfillment of God's plan from all ages. And Israel, the nation, was the forerunner of that, a type, if you will. So that's why in the Old Testament, and that's why the New Testament quotes Old Testament titles for Israel, for the church. It's because of Christ who fulfilled it. It doesn't mean we shouldn't pray for the Jewish people to come to know Jesus. It doesn't mean that we should not take an interest in peace in the Middle East. It also certainly doesn't excuse the horrible Christian anti-Semitism that happened over large parts of the church's history. And it's no good saying, oh, well, they weren't really Christians. Yes, some of the people you look up to as Christians will have said some horrific things about Jewish people. Um, but that's what I believe about Israel and the church and how the Bible holds together. I think the other systems that don't see it that way sort of miss the point. The center of the Bible is Jesus Christ. He is the chosen one. He is the true priest. He is the one who blesses all the nations. And we receive those blessings and privileges in him. So everything we are, a chosen race, a royal priest, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, we have because we're in Christ. Christ is the sum, substance, and center of the entire Bible. And indeed of all creation. So that's who we are. And that's why we are who we are. And now, what do we do? What do we do? We proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The church exists to make known God, to proclaim his glory, his excellencies. Excellencies, it means who God is and what he's done, what we call the person and work of God. God's character is seen through everything he does. We call it creation, how God's revealed himself. He reveals himself in creation, in scripture, and through Christ, ultimately. And there's overlap with all three of them, but those are the three that we have always, that the church has always taught. And we call it that because God's character is seen most fully, most clearly, and most gloriously through Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's done, his teaching, his life, his death, his resurrection, and his saving work. We see, especially on the cross, 
You know, we see on the cross, we see God's grace, God's love, God's kindness, God's mercy, God's sovereignty, God's holiness, God's justice, God's wrath. All of that we see at the cross. These are the excellencies of God. This is God's character. This is who God is. You want to know what God's like? Ultimately, go to the cross. That's what the songs were singing about. That's what scripture teaches. When you come to the Lord's Supper next week, which we will be having next week, look at the bread and wine and think, that's what God's like. God gave his son for me so that I could be a precious daughter and a treasured son. Once your enemy, now seated at your table, Jesus, thank you. And we're to proclaim those excellencies. How do we do it? Well, we do it by coming to church. We proclaim those excellencies to each other. Do you know when you sing, even if you can't sing a lick, you're ministering to the people at church because you're singing God's truth to them, even if you can't sing like me. The church, we, pre we preach the word, we share baptism and the Lord's Supper. They too proclaim the word. They show the work of Christ. We sing it. We sing about it. We pray about it. We talk about it. We live it. All this proclaims the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So, so commit to coming to church. I'm not having to go at the people that turned up late. I know you work really hard. No, seriously. <laughs> You're a blessing, you're amazing. So don't, because I know some churches can put a guilt trip on people. If you're ill, don't worry about it, but let's be serious about committing, about being with people. Because we're proclaiming the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Isn't it fair that God gets an hour of our time once a week? Again, public transport and what have you. You people, you're amazing. You keep me going. People who make, you know, you all keep me, you all keep me going. Believe me, more than you'll ever know. And we do it through our lives. Matthew 5, 16, the Lord Jesus said, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Your life is a, is a way of proclaiming the gospel. The holy life that you live. It won't be perfect, but it'll be really holy if you're a Christian. The joy that you have in Christ, the love that you have for him will cause people to give glory to your Father who is in heaven. That means could become Christians. <coughs> Indeed, we cannot help but do it. Proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We can't help but do it because it's so amazing what he's done. It's so amazing, and the joy he brings to our lives is something we want to share. with people in the church and out of it. Again, we've got to stress this, we share it with each other. When we go to life group, when you sit and have coffee or you meet up with people from church and you talk about the things of God, you're building each other up in the most holy faith. And for those outside, we cannot help but do it because we have something that we want to share with them too. And what do we receive? What do we receive? Peter goes on to say, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you have not received mercy, now you have received mercy. We are a people. The church is the people of God. Peter, like Paul in Ephesians 2, says, remember what you once were. You weren't a people. You know, the people Peter was writing about were from different parts of the world. 
but they're one people. The church is, is from different parts of the world and one people, even people here today from different parts of the world. Our, our ancestors go back a few generations, we're from different parts of the world. But we're one in Christ. We're one in Christ Jesus because of who he is and what he's done. And we're treasured, strangers and exiles, and now treasured sons and daughters. That's a beautiful truth, isn't it, that? You know, it just... J.I. Packer said it, I've never forgotten it. He said, to be pardoned by God the judge is a great blessing. To be adopted by God the Father is greater still. Greater still. It's not just that God is the, you know, we've, we've become, we've come into the nation. You know, Britain has a king. And it has a government, but we don't think of them as a father. But this king that we serve invites us in to intimacy, to delight, to joy. Think of the prodigal son in Luke 15. The son's coming back to his father's house and the father runs out to meet him, kisses him, wraps his arms around him, gives him a gown, gives him a ring and throws a massive party after his son has treated him worse than dirt. He actually wished his father dead because he asked for his inheritance. That's basically saying, I don't want, I wish, I, I, I can't be bothered standing around waiting for you to die, old man. Give me my money and let me go. Why just saying that to your father? Why just saying that to anybody? And the father runs out and meets him like that. That's what God does to us. Shows us that grace, that kindness, and he throws a party. And every time you wander from God, it happens again. So if you're far from God today and you're wondering, oh, can I go back to him? Yes, of course you can go back to him. He's still the same gracious, kind father that you met when you first came to him. Remember that when you first came to him? The lightness that was in your step, the joy that you felt in your heart, the knowing that he'd forgiven you. Yeah, believe me, you need it more today than you did back then. God doesn't change. We are a people, we are his treasured possession, and we, see, we receive mercy. I, told, I said grace was God giving us what we don't deserve. Well, mercy is the opposite. It's not giving us what we do deserve. We deserve God's condemnation for our sins. And, but in his mercy, he forgives us. In his compassion, his pity, the, the old English word pity meant compassion. It doesn't mean that today in modern English. We don't sort of like it really. Oh, don't take pity on me. I don't want it. No, it just means, in old English, it means you took pity on the homeless person. You showed compassion and tenderness to them. And that's what God does to us. He sees us on the road to destruction and he does something about it. And he does more. Like I say, he could have just forgiven us, but he doesn't. He makes us his children. He crowns us with steadfast love and mercy. He makes us one with his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and gives us all the blessings that he gave to Christ. Amen. Loves you just as much as he does the Lord Jesus Christ. John 17, 23. He loves you just as much as he loves his sinless son. Who obeyed him perfectly every moment of his life. And that delight he has for him, he has for you. That's what we receive, the delight of the Father. You could go on and on and on and on and on. But they're all encapsulated in the delight of the Father. The delight of God, yes, the delight of a Father. So I ask you, are you part of the treasured people of God? Have you been called out of darkness 
into his marvellous light. The light, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And in his kingdom there will be light forever. Have you taken Christ as your saviour? Asked him to forgive all your sins and committed your life to him. If you've not, we'd invite you to do that today, just as you are. If you've been wandering, we'd invite you to recommit yourself. You can do it alone if you want to. I mean, we should all be doing that anyway, to be honest. That's what we do at the Lord's Supper. We are recommitting ourselves to him. It's our oath of allegiance to the king. But will you do that today? and receive every blessing that Christ has purchased for you. If you are a Christian, live as one who belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. Love him with a jealous love and let nothing come between you and him. The old hymn, nothing between my soul and the Saviour, so that his blessed face may be seen nothing preventing the least of his favour, keep the way clear, let nothing between. He meant sins. I can't do that, why? As much as part of me would love to do it, it would bring a gap between me and my Lord. It would bring his displeasure, I can't do it. I don't want to do it anymore. Get Christ at the centre of your affections, my friends. Him. He who is the centre of all creation, the centre of all of Scripture, may be the centre of your life, your, heart, your head, your heart, your hands, in how you think, in how you feel, in how you work, in how you are at home, in how you are at church, in how you are at work, or wherever your front line is. Let it be for the glory of Christ. And receive God's love. God is jealous for his church. Now, of course, people sort of throw rocks at that verse in the Bible and say, God's a jealous God. Oh, why do you want to serve a God like that? Well, he's jealous in the way that any good husband is jealous for his wife's affection. Imagine if you're if a, if a husband, you know, I'll personalize it. Imagine if your husband didn't care if you loved him or not. Would you think he was a good husband? Imagine if, you, imagine if he came home, or a, a husband came home to their wife and said, you know, or, or she said to him, you know, I don't care if you love me or not. Imagine if a wife said that to her husband. You know, she'd come in from work and said, he said, I love you, darling, and then she said, I don't care, to be honest. No, that's, that's, that's what jealous means in that sense. There is a jealousy that's destructive, we all know that, but it's not the only type of jealousy. It's an exclusive love. Any good husband is jealous for his wife's affections. He wants to love her and to receive love in return. He wants to give her good things. And he wants that bond to be just the two of them, the bond between husband and wife. And that's what God is for us. God, you, I am your God and you are my people. The bond of husband and wife. Live all of life in obedience to him out of that love, that pure love, knowing who he is and what he's done. And give thanks. Because these passages should really make us thankful. Mm. I've feebly gone through some of the privileges we have as Christians. There's two verses here. There's an eternity of thanksgiving in these two verses. You want to know how to pray the Bible? Pray, which, you should be, which we should be doing. It's the best way to pray. Pray the Bible. Open it up. Read the passage that you're reading for the day and turn it into prayer. You'll know you're always praying in God's will then. Thank God that you're a... Thank you, Lord, that I'm a member of the chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a people for your own possession. But give thanks for every blessing that we have in Christ. And learn passages that list our blessings and give thanks to him. This is one of them. My two favorite ones are Psalm 103 
And I've mentioned it before, Ephesians 1. Just one at a time, a few verses at a time, just open them up and read through them and thank God for what you've read. And give thanks ultimately for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because all these blessings that we receive in all these passages that list where Paul and David and Peter are just bursting with praise, they, they, they more or less spew it out. They can't get it out quick enough. They're all ours because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of who he is and what he's done. And even in the hardest times, when you feel like you've got nothing on your side, you can give thanks to God for the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> the Lord Jesus Christ, he who is altogether lovely, and in him we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a people for his own possession. Amen. Amen. Lord God, we thank you. <laughs> that in your sovereign grace you chose us, you called us, and you gave us to Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that all these blessings are ours through him, and thank you that you have given us an eternal hope where we'll behold your glory forever in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.